Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, dear ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome you to the regional launch of the 2020 Human Development Report, The Next Frontier, Human Development and the Anthropocene. My name is Mirjana Spoljevic. I'm the regional director at UNDP for Europe and Central Asia. I want to start by welcoming our distinguished high-level panel, Mr. Achim Steiner, UNDP Administrator, His Excellency, Mr. Zevo Penderowski, President of the Republic of North Macedonia, His Excellency, Mr. Denis Mihal, Prime Minister of Ukraine, His Excellency, Mr. Aurelio Chokoy, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Moldova, her Excellency, Mrs. Natia Tornava, Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia, and His Excellency, Mr. Nenad Popovic, Minister of Innovation and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia. I also want to welcome our commentators today, Mr. Sodik Safoyev, First Deputy Chairman, Senate of the Oli Majlis of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Mrs. Ella Libanova, Director of the Institute for Demography and Social Studies at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, and Mrs. Omid Boyner of the Boyner Group and President of the Business for Goals platform in Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 marks the 30th anniversary of the Human Development Report. In 1990, when the report first appeared, it challenged the idea that economic growth was the dominant measure of progress. It was the time, if you remember, when Nelson Mandela walked out of prison, when the Berlin Wall was torn down, both physically and politically, enticing the international community to think of new avenues for international development cooperation. And this culminated two years later in the first Earth Summit in Rio. In that moment, UNDP offered an alternative to GDP, the so-called Human Development Index, which focused on the reality of people's lives and not on the size of economy. In the 30 intervening years between the first and the current report, the world has made great progress, but this progress has come at a high price. For the first time in the history of humankind, we have become a geological force, a force that is shaping the environment on a planetary scale. This HDR shows how continuing development progress in the age of the Anthropocene can be aligned with reducing our planetary pressures. Now, before I give the floor to the administrator of UNDP, I want to invite you all to view a compilation of messages from UNDP goodwill ambassadors and advocates. I don't think the film is playing. Okay, now we can. Throughout time, the planet has shaped all life. The planet has shaped all life. The planet has shaped all life. But now in the era of the human, we are shaping the planet. And truthfully, we are not doing a good job at it yet. Our actions are putting a lot of pressure on the world. Just look at 2020 with COVID-19, extreme weather and rampant wildfires. People have created this mess, but we can fix it. Empowered people can become agents of their own destiny. The world may seem stuck in its own ways. 
but we can take actions to create a new normal, whether that's expanding the role of women in society or using cleaner energy. In too many countries, fossil fuels remain the primary source of energy, but clean alternatives like solar power will help reduce our carbon emissions. These alternatives need to be made accessible and affordable without using too much of other finite resources. And we must learn to harness the power of nature at the same time as we protect its beauty and wonder. Moving to protect, sustainably manage and restore ecosystems in a way that promotes well-being. Too often, the decisions of a few people or countries hurt the most vulnerable people across the world. For all of us to flourish now and into the future, we must understand that we are all connected. The choices you make impact the whole world around you. Shaping the planet means taking bold steps. Bold steps for humans to survive and thrive in this new era. If we are going to change the world, we need you. We need you. We need you, our global leaders, to take bold action now. Achim Steiner, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, and dear Mariana, thank you for bringing us together today on the occasion of this launch. And I also want to thank our goodwill ambassadors who so often support us um, by helping the world understand what it is that we do and what it is also that is happening out there in the world this year. 2020 has defied all expectations. A tiny virus has humbled the human family, threatening to reverse decades of development. But COVID-19 is only a chapter in a bigger but lesser known saga marked by humans becoming the dominant force shaping the earth. Scientists have come to call this emerging era the Anthropocene or the age of humans. And in it, as this 2020 Human Development Report sets out, Humanity is waging a war against itself. Consider this, the total mass of the things humans have made, like buildings, roads, and bottle tops, now exceeds the total mass of all living things on the planet, from tiny bacteria to giant whales to forests, according to new research. Today, humans literally have the power to alter the atmosphere and the biosphere in which we live, the power to destroy and the power to repair. No species has ever had that kind of power before. With it, we humans have achieved incredible things, but we have also taken the earth and all the people on it to the brink. 4,000 generations could live and die before the carbon dioxide released from the industrial revolution to today is scrubbed from our atmosphere. And yet we all and decision makers continue to subsidize fossil fuels, prolong our carbon habit like a drug running through the economy's veins. People who have more capture the benefits of nature and export the costs, choking opportunities for people who have less and minimizing their ability to do anything about it. COVID-19 is therefore both a troubling glimpse into what our new normal could be and a gateway to change. This is a unique moment. It calls for a unique conversation. That is what I know we will have today in such distinguished company. We began this conversation on Tuesday at the global launch of this 30th anniversary report, which I had the pleasure of co-hosting with the Prime Minister of Sweden, where we were privileged to be joined by the Crown Princess of Sweden, the President of South Africa, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and thousands of guests across the world. It is my great honor to continue this important conversation today with so many eminent leaders from government, academia, and civil society and business across the middle-income countries of Europe, Central Asia, and Turkey. As you know, for 30 years, UNDP has released the Human Development Report and Index ranking all countries by health, education, and living standards, a proxy for the freedom and opportunities people living in those countries experience. This year, constrained by mostly pre-pandemic data, we decided to do something new, something bold, and long overdue. We added countries' consumption and carbon footprints to the Human Development Index. The result is less rosy, but, clearer, but provides a clearer analysis of human progress. Plotting out the data on a graph reveals a profound insight. There are countries that leave a minimal imprint on the planet, 
there are countries with prosperous populations, but not one nation in the world sits in both camps today. In the graphs used to illustrate this data in the Human Development Report, we have quite literally an empty box. Filling this empty box in terms of the future of development is the next frontier for human development. It may sound daunting, but the way forward is not rocket science. It comes down to incentives, social norms, and nature-based solutions that will reset how people and planet interact and the choices leaders make today as they build forward better from COVID-19 and everything that it has brought to us. Consider the impact of the pandemic on poverty. There could be 1 billion poor people in the world by the year 2030, a quarter due just to COVID-19, or we could choose to do things differently, driving progress towards the sustainable development goals with ambitious policy options, social protection measures, and also a response and a deal on debt. For example, a six months temporary basic income for nearly 3 billion people during this pandemic would be equivalent to only one third of what poor countries paid in the year 2020 to service their external debt. President Penderovsky, I know we are exploring the introduction of a temporary basic income in North Macedonia together with your government and the finance think tank in Skopje. We have experienced a revolution in digital dependence in the past 10 months, but for many going virtual as we are today is just not an option yet. Four out of five children were effectively out of school in poorer countries in the first half of this year because of the digital divide. We could let it deepen or we could choose to invest in a once, gener once in a generation effort to close it. Minister Chokoy, I'm delighted that UNDP is working with your government, private companies and the association of ICT companies to upgrade distance learning systems for primary and secondary school students in Moldova. And Minister Popovich, thank you. I'm pleased that we are working with your Ministry of Environmental Protection on a public call for innovative digital projects that apply and expand circular economy principles in Serbia. And consider the impact that choices made today will have on the climate emergency. By the year 2100, the richest countries in the world could experience up to 18 fewer days per year of extreme weather as a result of climate change while the poorest countries could experience up to 100 days more. That number could still be cut in half if the Paris Agreement is fully implemented. Prime Minister Schmihal, I'm delighted that we are working together and with the European Union to support Ukraine implement its nationally determined contribution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions under the Paris Agreement, and thereby also facilitate that notion of a greener recovery of building forward better. And Minister Tornava, I'm pleased that we are working with your government and development partners to implement a 74 million program to reduce climate risk in Georgia. At UNDP, we take this report very seriously and we have been reflecting on it and are preparing a new three-part offer to build on the conversation this report has opened. It will include expertise and tools that could assist countries to simulate alternative futures based on different policy choices building on the data in the report and beyond. Integrated programmatic and financial support that goes beyond the quick technical fixes to accelerate the transition towards greener and more equitable development paths. It's what our citizens in every country are expecting of us. And tailored national and local policy dialogues to support the evolution of new social norms and build coalitions for change, not least with our youth, that so-called next generation that in fact is stepping up to provide leadership already now. Our support is designed to assist decision makers look beyond recovery towards the year 2030, making choices and managing complexity and uncertainty in four main areas that now define our way forward. Governance, social protection, green economy, and digital disruption. It builds on our role in technically leading the UN's socioeconomic response to the pandemic. Excellencies, friends, and all those of you who are listening in today, this is the 30th anniversary of the concept of human development. Much has changed since that first human development report 
challenge the narrow primacy of gross domestic product as a singular measure of human progress. But hope and possibility have not. We are not the last generation of the Anthropocene. We are the ones who get to decide what this, the first generation of the Anthropocene, will be remembered for. Our future is not about choosing between people or trees. It's about choosing to do things differently. That, in my mind, is the next frontier for human development. I truly hope that together with such distinguished panelists today, leaders in their countries, but many of you who are following this discussion at this unique moment, we commit to exploring these new frontiers together. On behalf of the Human Development Report office and team, and all of us in UNDP, thank you so much for joining us today. Back to you, Mirana. Thank you. Thank you, Achim, for your opening statement. And I would now like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Stevo Pendarovsky, the President of the Republic of North Macedonia, to deliver his remarks. President, you have to... Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Yes, we can hear you very well. well I'm glad to be among you. Distinguished participants, esteemed excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address this regional promotion of the UNDP Human Development Report. A last year report showed that a new generation of inequalities related to education, technology, and climate change was on the horizon, which could be the source of new major divisions in society. And when we looked at the findings with concern, we didn't even think that this year we would face the COVID-19 pandemic. Every crisis can have long-term effects on human development that are sometimes felt by several generations. But systemic crises such as this pandemic penetrate much deeper and can erode the achievements that have been worked on for years and even decades. This crisis has negatively affected the health, economic, educational, and in general, the social aspects of human development. The UNDP's simulations of the first half of 2020 indicate that the combined impact of these shocks could cause a major slowdown in human development. According to the International Monetary Fund, this is the biggest economic crisis in the last 90 years. It's estimated that around 100 million people worldwide will be pushed into extreme poverty. The health systems of even the most developed countries are under enormous pressure. We know that the average in the European Union is five hospital beds per 1,000 inhabitants. The Republic of North Macedonia has 4.2 hospital beds per 1,000 inhabitants and about three doctors for the same number of inhabitants. But in conditions of a pandemic, clearly this is not enough. The pandemic has also sh shaken the educational systems, parents, children, and teachers who have to adopt to the new reality. Education, which plays a vital role in overcoming social inequalities in a society, has been paralyzed at times. The pandemic exposes the weaknesses of the economic health and educational systems. It gives us insight into the health of our societies and shows that at the heart of this crisis lies the injustice and systemic inequality that's being passed down from one generation to the other. This systemic crisis further highlights the unresolved tensions between the economy and the ecology, between people and technology. All this is due to the dominant, in my view, unsustainable paradigm of uncontrolled economic progress at the expense of nature, more or less. Almost all countries are facing a decline in human development, but countries and societies with greater social inequality and more environmental threats are hardest hit. The World Bank in this year's Human Capital Index warns of a worrying trend. The greater the country's economic losses, the less investment in social and human capital, thus creating a downward spiral. It inevitably reflects on climate action. It's expected that in many countries, the economic damage from the pandemic will be repaired at the expense of the environmental and climate agenda. This will only keep alive the unsustainable economic model of growth and development based on fossil, on fossil fuels. Dear participants, I would like to emphasize that I do not expect this to be the case with the Republic of North Macedonia. As a candidate country for membership in the EU, we fully support the European Green Agreement and are ready to contribute to the transformation of Europe into the first continent we decarbonized economies by 2050. 
In this regard, I will support the government's plans for submission of revised and more ambitious national contributions to climate change. Human development in North Macedonia is continuously growing. With the growth of 14.3% from the year 2000 to 2019, we are above the world average for the analyzed period. Among the positive indicators, I would like to emphasize that the global index of multidimensional poverty shows that North Macedonia has the fastest, fastest reduction of poverty in relative figures. Still, we must aim higher to meet the needs of Macedonian citizens, especially our youth. The pandemic is an opportunity for decisive steps to restructure our economies, industries, technologies, and in general, for lifestyle in line with the sustainable development principles. A policy focused on short-term results will only achieve a short-term growth. If we treat crises in isolation from each other, we'll only alleviate the symptoms without curing the humanity. The HDR show, should help us stay focused and not deviate from the main goals. The 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. We'll need a lot of energy to get back to where we were a year ago. We must work with solidarity and commitment to achieve a development that will guarantee the innate dignity of every human being, and of course, the integrity of the entire nation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, President. Thank you for your encouraging statement. Uh, Achim, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Prime Minister's office connected, but he's physically held back in Parliament at the moment. We are being kept informed uh, about his joining. Meanwhile, I would like to pass to pass the floor on to His Excellency, Mr. Aurelu Chokoy, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Moldova. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much, distinguished guests, excellencies, dear Mr. Achim Steiner. On behalf of the government of the Republic of Moldova, I would like to thank you for this invitation, opportunity to express my views and thoughts on the sustainable human development of Moldova. But before that, I would like to congratulate United Nations Development Program globally for this very relevant focus and timely narrative of the Global Human Development Report. Our choices in doing development affect directly and indeed indirectly the environment around us, the nature and the people, including future generations. The recent impact of the COVID-19 and natural disasters, such as drought on a small country like Moldova is affected health and education sectors, as well as has profound negative effects on the economy. The same challenges are faced by the entire region. It also reminds us about how vulnerable we became when it comes to natural disasters, changing climate conditions and climate change in general. Our human development index steadily increased, and we are now in the group of countries with high human development index. Yet, the circumstances are such that require more accelerated efforts on almost all sustainable development goals, but also greater ambitions to sustain the achievements and increase resilience to the new surfacing risks. I am proud to note that Moldova has become the fourth country in the world that submitted its 2020 nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, joining the Marshall Islands, Norway, and Suriname. The country enhanced its national determined contribution to 70% attention unconditional and up to 88% conditional reductions in greenhouse gases emissions in 2030 compared to 1990. As we read the UNDP's 2020 Global Human Development Report, we are delighted to see that Moldova is mentioned as an example of a nation 
that is making socioeconomic progress and at the same time, its carbon and material footprint is relatively and comparatively limited, underlining that lighter pressure on the planet is possible. Yet there are many areas for improvement indeed. Consumption behavior is just one of important aspects. Modeling such behavior by reducing inefficiencies is very relevant. With UNDP Moldova support, we have recently concluded one of the largest in the region behavioral experiment to reduce electricity use at the level of households that proved how social norms trigger more responsible consumption. To mention that we are almost fully dependent as a nation on the import of electricity from our neighbors and such energy is still produced from fossil fuels. Going forward, we believe we would like to focus on several key aspects. For example, recover from the deep crisis induced by the COVID-19 and equally make sure that the emerging opportunities for a more sustainable human development are captured by the country and the people. We do require wider consensus from the development partners to ordinary citizens to mobilize ourselves for a greener recovery. Second, to find a new ways to sustain progress. An important part of this process is related to connecting citizens and private sector, build trust in institutions, modernize public services, support digital transformation of the country and so on and so forth. Third, accelerate achievement of the sustainable development goals and expand human development in balance with the planet by tackling complex development problems in more systemic manner through long-term thinking and acting locally, which is very important. Finally, we would like to sincerely thank United Nations Development Program for its consistent and continuous support to the government and to the people of this country in achieving sustainable development goals. Our long-standing partnership is even more relevant as we are reaching the new frontier and entering the age of humans. Sorry for being so short. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for your short statement. It was a very encouraging one again, and it is now my pleasure to invite Her Excellency Mrs. Natia Turnava, Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia, to deliver her statement. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, dear Mr. Steiner, First of all, let me thank organizers of this important webinar and particularly UNDP and its team who made it possible to share our experiences regarding human development and impact of COVID-19 pandemic on its dynamics. It is worth to mention that the Human Development Report 2020, together with the comprehensive coverage of human development aspects and policy recommendations, also proposed newly developed Planetary Pressures Adjusted Human Development Index, PHTI, which also takes into consideration climate change aspects. The limitation of GDP as a measure of a country's economic performance and social progress has been a subject of considerable debate over the past two decades. Well-being is a multidimensional concept which cannot be measured by market production of, or GDP alone. We are well aware that the Human Development Index, HDI, uh, was created with a goal to emphasize that not only economic growth, but also people and their abilities could be the key criteria to evaluate the country's development. The HDI serves as a frame of reference for both social and economic development, and now already climate change aspects are reflected in Planetary Adjusted Human Development Index. According to the HDI uh, ranking, uh, Georgia ranks of 61 
out of 189 countries. And Georgia is a member of the very high human development index country group. In the planetary pressures adjusted human development index that adjusts the standard HDI by climate change aspect, the score of Georgia amounts to 0 0.772 and is ranked uh, 31st worldwide, which is important acknowledgement of Georgia's sustainable development path. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic once again proved the importance of social policy, sustainable and climate resilient development. While the impact of the pandemic will vary from country to country, it will most likely increase uh, poverty and inequalities globally and make achievement of SDGs even more essential and well more challenging. The COVID-19 outbreak has significantly set back global economy and it represents one of the most formidable challenges in recent history to governments, businesses and society. The policy priorities emphasized in UN framework for the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID-19 fully coincide the main directions of our economic support package, national action plans and long-term development priorities as well. Georgia responded to the COVID-19 outbreak in various ways to contain the virus outbreak and at the same time dampen negative economic impact of the shock and continue building strong economic foundations for swift economic recovery. Georgia has devised a wide range of targeted fiscal, monetary and financial market policy measures to support businesses, business sector and particularly SMEs sustain employment and support most exposed and vulnerable groups of the society by strengthening social safety nets. Among the concrete measures, I would like to outline wage subsidies, cash transfers to households, including those in the informal sector, expanded social transfers, temporary tax reliefs for businesses, loan restructuring, modified state support programs tailored to existing challenges and so on and so forth. While proactively dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 shock is the near term priority, we are committed to continue implementation, the structural reforms and our socioeconomic agenda to achieve sustainable economic goals. Despite the significant progress driven by the spirit of the SDGs, which seeks a sustainable interplay between the economic growth, human development and environment, the government of Georgia has been determined to target persistent inequalities in the Georgian society. Bringing down digital divide and inequality gap is one of the main challenges worldwide and Georgia is not an exception. We are strengthening efforts to support businesses and communities that have been impacted by the pandemic. And in this process, we're putting special emphasis on the measures that will improve living standards and reduce inequality between urban and rural areas by allocating additional funding for roads, water supply, gasification, and sewage systems, as well as are implementing preventive measures for reducing damage caused by natural disasters. On the other hand, we are developing broadband infrastructure for areas without internet access. During pandemic, when whole world battling health emergency crisis, we should not forget climate change, which is one of the greatest threats facing humanity with far reaching and devastating impacts on people, the environment and the economy. Planning and investing in systematic adaptation measures and in the innovation that comes with it can unlock new opportunities and provide multiple dividends by avoiding econ economic losses and delivering additional social and environmental benefits. With the support of GIZ, Ministry of uh, Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia is working on Climate Resilient Economic Development Program, CRED, to evaluate climate change impact on different sectors of economy by implementing tools for economic modeling. As a result, better assessment and planning of adaptation measures will enable us to unlock climate resilient economic development by investing in necessary infrastructure. Furthermore, 
Green growth is an important part of the process that will help deliver sustainable development through focusing on the role of natural capital as a driver of economic growth. Under EU for environmental program, Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia has launched uh, elaboration of green growth concept, which aims to uh, preserve natural capital and increase people's environmental well-being by supporting environment related actions, demonstrating and unlocking opportunities for greener growth and setting mechanisms of, for better managing environmental risks and impacts. After adoption of green growth concept, elaboration of green growth strategy is planned with our partner organizations. Together with above mentioned measures, the Waste Management Code of Georgia was adopted, which introduced an extended producer responsibility EPR concept for specific waste streams. Besides, the energy reform will contribute to foster a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic by promoting energy savings and efficiency, as well as supporting business environment by promoting more competitive pricing. I would like once again thank UNDP for its great and useful efforts for achieving sustainable development goals and prioritizing human development aspects in policy making process. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, uh, for your excellent statement. And I'm moving on to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Nenad Popovic, Minister of Innovation and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia. The floor is yours, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests and participants of the conference, good afternoon. We are living in a remarkable period of history, one that will affect each of us in decades to come. The list of challenges the world is facing is long. No matter how we describe the COVID-19 pandemic for billions around the world, the virus has changed life as we know it. Governments and public sector organizations are trying to respond quickly in order to equip their citizens and business with resources to minimize the consequences. Furthermore, the man-made climate change is one of the biggest threats facing our world today. Governments all over the world are making commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to limit its damaging effects and to develop sustainable economic and living environment. Serbia is working on and looking forward to adopt green agenda in full capacity. To meet these commitments, we need a more aggressive policy action and a rapid shift away from fossil fuel, changing the focus to the renewable energy sources. In order to respond to the pandemic challenges effectively, the government of the Republic of Serbia is taking numerous measures through which we apply modern technological solutions from various fields of information technology, such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, smart cities. In March 2020, after the outbreak of the pandemic, Cabinet of the Minister for Innovation of the Republic of Serbia organized a mayor campaign named Be a Hero. The idea of the project was to mobilize members of innovative community and use their enormous potential in fight with the pandemic. The results were great. We received more than 150 different solutions. Some of them we immediately developed and applied successfully in a short period of time. We are planning to continue to use all innovations and solutions of the community in the fight with COVID-19 and fully exploit all existing potentials in a sustainable manner. Sustainability is a powerful force for positive change in our world. It drives transformation, innovation, and improvement across all aspects of society. No longer limited to conserving natural resources, sustainability now includes a broad range of challenges, including urban growth, transportation, our carbon footprints, and even people's work-life balance. 
In this regard, we need to use all available infrastructure to tackle these challenges. Urbanization models that incorporate digital technologies and smart cities are addressing some key urbanization and sustainability challenges. Smart cities are built on complex and intelligent frameworks of digital networks, connecting citizens, governments, and objects that simultaneously send and receive data. Cloud-based software application receive, manage, and analyze this data and transform it into real-time intelligence that will help improve the way we work, travel, and live. Using the new technologies, City managers can monitor traffic flows, noise levels, air quality, energy usage, and travel patterns in real time. These insights allow business, citizens, and the government to review and make changes swiftly to improve city services and amenities. Data is the lifeblood of decision-making and the raw material for accountability. Today, in the private sector, analysis of big data is commonplace with consumer profiling, personalised services and predictive analysis being used for marketing, advertising and management. Similar techniques could be adopted to gain real-time insights into people's well-being and to target aid interventions to vulnerable groups. New sources of data such as satellite data, new technologies and new analytical approaches, if applied responsibly, can enable more agile, efficient and evidence-based decision-making and can better measure progress on the sustainable development goals in a way that is both inclusive and fair. The intelligence of machines and robotics with deep learning capabilities have big impacts on business governments and society and influencing the trends in global sustainability. Artificial intelligence software brings great benefits to society with machine learning being used to improve services and automated decision-making. Artificial intelligence can identify and solve complex problems faster and more effectively than previous methods and its possibilities and advantages are infinite for every sector. To conclude, we have a big task ahead of us and we must have high goals despite the challenges of the pandemic. Innovative solutions in Serbia come from smart young engineers and students. Through the implementation of their innovation, we are strengthening the community of young people who are one of the key factors of development in Serbia on a sustainable basis in the future. Serbia is committed to continue efforts to improve energy efficiency, to use a larger share of renewable energy sources, to develop smart cities, artificial intelligence, and big data infrastructure. We will do everything to reach globally promote sustainable development goals. Together, we can make this world a better place for living. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Popovic. And uh, I want to thank uh, the President and all the ministers for, for having joined this opening segment today on the regional launch of, of the 2020 Human Development Report. I'm very grateful knowing how busy your schedules are, uh, but even more grateful for your support and commitment to the HDR's vision and strategy going forward. This region, Europe and Central Asia, is hard hit by the pandemic. And the pandemic came when after decades of uh, reduced inequalities, uh, they have started rising again, reinforcing the challenge, cha development challenges that we see in the region. But we will uh, continue working with you and, and also serving as a model for, for many other countries in promoting green economy, reducing climate change impact and rehabilitating a natural environment that has been for decades um, degrading because of uh, several uh, 
you know, bad impacts uh, from wrong economic doing, but also other um, systemic failures of the past. But we also want to continue working with you and hear you on digital transformation. We want to put digital to the service of the people in the region. And we have progressed greatly during COVID and are happy to report in many ways that digital has helped us reach the people and to leave no one behind during this pandemic. With this, I would like to briefly hand back to the administrator before he has to move on as well to another meeting. And then we'll continue with the presentation of the report by Ben Slay, our senior economist. Achim, over to you. Thank you, Mirjana. And um, I, I have listened very carefully just now because in each of your contributions and um, examples that you brought, lies to me the very reason why UNDP is still present, is still a partner in Europe and Central Asia to your countries, to your nations and to the development innovations that, that you are leading. I, I truly appreciate the examples that were given. And um, to me, what the United Nations Development Program represents today is not the, the one-way street of um, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. We are a network we connect learning and frontier thinking across the globe. And just from the examples that you have provided in policy, in green recovery, in climate measures, but also in tackling issues of inequality within a development pathway, lies so many of the, the frontline challenges and the choices that, that need to be made. I see UNDP today as a connective tissue of precisely the whole of government approach to thinking about the future of development of a nation in which um, I think we all sense that our citizens have become more impatient on two fundamental yardsticks that define first of all the future success of our societies that's what the human development report I think highlights but also what people consider to be their expectation of government of the role of state and they have to do with equality, equity, inequality, but I actually would even reduce it down to a sense of what is fair. Fairness is a very fundamental human sentiment. And, you know, for us who work in development in ministries of economy, as presidents, as prime ministers, the challenge is, you know, how much is too much inequality? At what point is the lack of sustainability not just something you pay temporarily, but you actually begin to compromise the future of the next generation, never mind the quality of life of the present generation. It is around this equity and sustainability variables that our societies are really struggling right now. And across the world, before this pandemic hit us, we already saw an underlying sense of frustration, discomfort, um, and in some parts of the world, yes, an increasing polarization um, when citizens do, not long, do no longer feel that um, they belong to something that they believe in. I think the Human Development Report this year echoes to precisely the journeys that you have just described. And I'm so grateful that you chose to take the time because I think it's not only an act of being together in this event, it speaks to the sincerity and I think the seriousness that you also attach to these issues. And I obviously very much appreciate the positive feedback you gave us on this year's Human Development Report. It is an experimental planetary adjusted human development index. We, we hesitated um, in the first six months of this year, whether we could produce a human development report and secondly, whether we could produce one that would be meaningful to the moment in time and not simply a continuation of what was there before. I think we took a bold, but I think we took the right decision. And in the initial response and reactions, I think many people across the world recognize this moment in time. And I want to end by saying that, as UNDP and Mariana just said it, we are deeply committed to working with you, learning from you, connecting the world of development that really transcends this traditional developing developed countries narrative today. Because some of the most bold and innovative countries um, around the world don't have to be the wealthiest. And that is something that we also learned and therefore invested heavily over the last 18 months in establishing the innovation labs, the accelerator labs, as we call them in UNDP teams, in your countries. Over 90 countries now have them. 
And I know that, for instance, uh, Minister Popovich um, in Serbia, the Accelerator Lab has been part of a new generation of partnerships and collaborative uh, initiatives. And I hope that it is that UNDP firmly embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 agenda, but also committed to a future of development agenda, rather than simply looking backwards and analyzing what we have not accomplished. Therein lies, I think, the inspiration, the empowerment that we can bring to citizens, that you as governments, as leaders in the state institutions are asked to deliver, and that we in the United Nations and I with my team in UNDP are proud to be partners to you. Thank you again, and uh, Mirjana, once again, thank you for managing to arrange today's launch in your region also. I'm delighted to, to have been part of it. Thank you, Arkem. It was my pleasure to invite uh, such distinguished speakers today uh, to the regional launch of the HDR. Now, uh, Excellencies, President, Ministers, if you allow, uh, I will now move to the second part, uh, a more substantive uh, presentation of the Human Development Report, followed by inputs of our mentioned commentators. I invite Ben Slay, Chief Economist in the Bureau for Europe and the CIS, uh, to present the report. We will be very brief. Uh, um, the full version of this presentation will be made available to you uh, via link. Over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Miriana. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to very briefly present this report from the perspective of the middle income countries of Europe, Central Asia and, and Turkey, what's most relevant uh, and most useful to consider going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, as we know, this is the 30th anniversary report, uh, human development report, focusing on renewing human development for the Anthropocene, a focus on mechanisms to catalyze change, but also to better measure progress uh, in the Anthropocene. The key principles for this, as emphasized in the report, are environmental stewardship, equity, and innovation, with the key mechanisms to realize these principles being incentives, regulations, uh, nature-based systems, and social norms and values, or changing them. Next slide, please. Everyone is always interested in how their countries compare uh, and rank in the Human Development uh, Index. Here are the Human Development Index or HDI scores for the countries that we work with in Europe and Central Asia. As we can see, uh, a good number of them, uh, including uh, Montenegro, uh, Georgia, and Serbia. Uh, countries were very grateful for the representation and participation in this launch today are in the very high human development category with a score above 0.8 out of one, which is the highest possible score uh, for the HDI. But most of the other countries are in the high human development category, reflecting the very uh, impressive development uh, accomplishments uh, that they have managed to uh, put together. Uh, with a smaller number of countries in the medium human development category. So uh, this is uh, in broad brushstrokes how countries compare if we look at the basic measurement of human development. Next slide, please. But we know that we need to adjust these uh, HDIs, these traditional approaches to measuring development to reflect the impact of planetary pr pressures and has been mentioned uh, especially by UNDP Administrator Achim Steiner. We are doing this through the Planetary Pressures uh, Adjusted HDI or PHDI. And what we see here is a graph of all the countries of the world where uh, if, the, if there were no planetary pressures or not significant ones, then the PHDI and the HDI would be essentially the same. And that is the case for many low income, uh, or excuse me, low human development uh, countries. But as we move up the human development scale, we tend to find more and more countries deviating from this 45 degree line. And when we get to the very high human development category, uh, the, the green dots on this graph, we see more and more space opening up between where the dots are and where the 45 degree line is. So what we're talking about is adjusting the human development index for 
per capita greenhouse gas emissions and per capita material footprint data with material footprint simply being the amount of resources used uh, on a per person basis. What we find is that as human development increases, uh, the planetary pressures increase and uh, reversing that dynamic is as been mentioned, the key challenge, a new frontier for human development going forward. Next slide, please. So how do these countries compare when we uh, take into account the, the um, planetary pressures adjusted human development index or rather the difference between the country dots and that 45 degree line on the previous slide? Well, on average, there's a 7.3% difference between that 45 degree line and where countries actually are. And we see that many countries in this region, such as North Macedonia, such as Georgia, such as Moldova, I have a smaller deviation from the line of equality between the human development index and the planetary pressures adjusted human development index. And what this means is that they tend to move up significantly in the rankings once the HDIs are adjusted for planetary pressures. Um, but even a country like Serbia, that's a little bit above the world average in this respect, nonetheless manages to move up because the deviation is not quite as great as some of the countries where uh, there's a much greater uh, carbon and material footprint. So this can be seen as an opportunity for transformation, uh, for ensuring that development is sustainable, that uh, economic growth can uh, be uh, aligned with reductions in the planetary uh, pressures that uh, people can mean for the the ecosystems and nature-based systems on which we depend. Next slide, please. So finally, what sorts of concrete policy and programming recommendations are in the report that can be particularly useful for the countries we're discussing here today? Well, we mentioned that the key mechanisms for change are incentives, regulation, social norms, and values. In particular, in terms of incentives, one of the ways that incentives are a little bit misleading right now is that billions of dollars are invested in this region on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and if we can reduce those, not only do we improve incentives uh, and discourage use of unsustainable energy consumption patterns, but we also have more resources to finance other things, such as reductions in inequality by investing in social protection, for example, to close gaps and safety nets to make pension systems more sustainable in the long term. Uh, we can also use uh, reductions in fossil fuel subsidies to reduce taxes on labor, which tend to push employment and economic activity into the informal sector and make it harder for companies to create good jobs. And fiscal resources saved from cutting fossil fuel subsidies and also support investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. In terms of regulation, uh, land use regulation, building regulation is particularly important, especially when we look at a number of countries in this region, especially in the Western Balkans uh, and in Eastern Europe, where populations are shrinking, especially in rural areas. We can just let uh, this rural uh, uh, outflow of population uh, continue, or we can look to actively redesign rural areas and small towns mm -hmm. to take advantage of opportunities for restoring biodiversity and strengthening nature-based systems on which many people's income generation prospects depend. And finally, in terms of social norms and values, uh, there are, I think, significant opportunities for increased communication between governments and societies to encourage reduce, reuse, recycle as a basic way that households as well as companies and governments organize themselves. This means, for example, investing more in municipal waste management, but it also means uh, uh, empowering local communities to take advantage of economic growth and prosperity through stronger nature-based solutions, be this sustainable forestry, be this ecotourism or other ways. So on that note, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to strongly recommend that you download the report if you haven't done so already and become more familiar with some of the policy and programming recommendations and continuing this discussion that we are having today in your countries to see how to make 
we take advantages of the new opportunities for human development and sustainable development in the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And as always, and every year, thank you for translating the global report uh, into uh, the, what it means for the region. Um, dear participants, excellencies, I just want to also let you know that you have the possibility to pose questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, we will collect them and we will use them for, for the uh, commentators uh, uh, part of, of, um, of this launch. Now, before we move on to the commentators, um, I want to again invite you to watch a film on what the Anthropocene means uh, for the general public. Um, I would like to invite Justin to play the film before I invite Mr. Sodik Sapoya to take the floor. Over to you, Justin. Thank you. Anthropocene. Uh, Giorgio, help me. Do I have to pronounce it correctly? Some of this is something medical. Something to do with old. Uh, I think that's to do with climate change. So something to do with people? Anthro means man, right? Or human man? I don't know the meaning of that word. Oh, the Anthropocene. Yes, I know what that word means. Can I get a hint? The current geological age. Viewed as the period during which human activity has been dominant influence on climate and environment. I think it means that the environment and it's been damaged. Oh, we're in the Anthropocene. Current geological age, should have known that. <laughs> Man, that's such a good word for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed this small sequence uh, against this backdrop. I will now invite Mr. Sodik Safoyev, First Deputy Chairman, Senate of the Oli Majlis of the Republic of Uzbekistan, to comment on what we have heard so far. Senator Safoyev's stewardship of the Human Development Handbook for Parliamentarians and his support for the introduction of human development coursework at the University of World Economy in Tashkent while he was rector, afford him a very broad perspective of what human development can mean in practice in the region. As Senator, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ms. Mirjanas Olajegger, for your kind introduction. I deeply honor Mr. Kim Steiner, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me express my sincere gratitude for the invitation to today's online event, since I am perhaps representing most eastern part of today's webinar, I'd like to tell you good evening, because today, now it's almost eight o'clock in the evening in Uzbekistan. We gathered in challenging times, and I truly hope that you and your closed one are doing well and staying safe. And I'd like to congratulate all of us with the launching of this new human development report. Frankly, the uh, human development report uh, had a uh, very important impact of our generation's way of thinking. We should recognize that. It created new paradigm of progress, and it was especially important for us among the transitional countries with the heavy legacy of all Soviet totalitarian system and readjusted of uh, our understanding of the priorities of development of, and uh, uh, the goals of good governance. Of course, today we should uh, comprehend the COVID-19 lessons. And for let me make three to my mind, very important conclusions of, of, from this pandemic. First of all, we should admit that we are vulnerable. And uh, the vulnerable, not only the developing countries, but 
highly developed societies as well. So we might maybe conclusion that humanity is the vulnerable. Second conclusion, to my mind, is very important to recognize that pandemic is not a cause of today's problem. It's only exacerbated existing and problems which we inherited from the uh, past decades. The main contradiction of contemporary world is uh, between globalization and absence of international legal system to address the problems caused by globalization. I disagree with all those who think that the pandemic will lead to the deglobalization. It cannot be stopped. But what should we do if we rethink our policy vis-a-vis -vis the new realities emerged with the globalization? The main problem, to my mind, is that the capacity of international organizations, which COVID demonstrated very well, due to the lack of legal, institutional, and financial uh, resource deficit, is limited. We all state that post-pandemic world will be different. Maybe it would be more correct to say that it should be different, and we are we should be different as well. It's especially important for Central Asian countries, including Uzbekistan. It's a landlocked uh, region with heavy heritage, and, uh, with the, which should address many challenging issues. Eco ecological problems is one of them. First of all, I'd like to mention water scarcity growing in Uzbekistan. And I would uh, recommend or ask Professor Slay, maybe include to you to your next point, um, uh, uh, alongside with the uh, energy uh, and others, addressing the deficit of water resources as well. For Central Asia, it's very important. Nuclear or radioactive and biological wastes uh, contaminated in Central Asia is also an important ecological issue. And of course, RLC, classical anthropological catastrophe, when during the life of one generation, the biggest in the land, inland lake evaporated. And uh, today has a huge impact on the livelihood and well being of huge area and it, it, its impact might be uh, observed not only in Central Asia, but far beyond, even in Scandinavia. And I'd like to draw attention to all of our partners participating there, according to the initiative of President Mirziarev, uh, during his speech and address uh, on the 73rd General Assembly of United Nations, the uh, United Nations created uh, the multilateral trust fund addressing the social economic development of RLC. It's not only about Uzbekistan, it's uh, uh, for the people of whole Central Asia. And I'd like to use the chance and invite all countries to participate in implementation of the programs under the aegis of this fund. Lastly, let me point that uh, today we all feel the need to enhance human development pro, uh, reports under the United Nations. We think that uh, we today should not only register existing pro, uh, problems, but to take proactive steps. And uh, uh, none, we should realize that none of our problems are local or domestic one. All of them as a transnational character and it by definition it uh, requires international multinational uh, approach education and research is very important of course the achievements of professor amartya san and his inputs and insights done in the beginning of era of globalization in 1990 is very important but today we're living in a different world and i think that it's time to support research and scientific uh, programs uh, addressing the issues regarding with the human development in contemporary world.
And in conclusion, I'd like to tell that uh, Parliament uh, is a very important institution. Uh, today, the role of Parliament everywhere in each society, including Uzbekistan, is growing. We're trying to exercise and strengthen the parliamentary oversight over the SDGs. Uh, in Uzbekistan, we're working uh, in close cooperation with the uh, UNDP office in Uzbekistan. And by the way, I'd like once again to commend uh, UNDP office in Uzbekistan and its leader, Matilda Dimovska, for supporting the new project, Advancing Deeper National SDG Integration in Parliament of Uzbekistan. We think that it has a, uh, a very important dimension or, of the combining of our e efforts. Once again, I'd like to express my appreciation for inviting us in participating in this um, uh, event and congratulate all of us with launching new human development program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. You have mentioned many important issues in your in your uh, comments, and we are definitely aware of the RLC not only being a huge environmental and economic challenge to the region, but also a, a great opportunity to to show how a transformation towards green economy, green agriculture, um, can actually um, rehabilitate the region and and foster growth and well-being for everybody. Um, but for this, and I agree with you as well, we have to move science, diplomacy and cooperation closer together. And we will need not only a large economic footprint or you know, uh, material footprint in, in, in, going, in, in trying to transform the RLC region towards, towards a better future, um, but we will also need technology and innovation going forward and again, opportunities arise if we do it systematically and, and with a clear strategy in mind. Now, let me move on uh, to Mrs. Ella Libanova, Director of the Institute for Demography and Social Studies at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences to share her views. Mrs. Libanova directed pathbreaking research on the disaggregation of, HD, of the HDI for all of Ukraine's regions in a way that is useful for development policy makers, both at the national and at the local level. Mrs. Libanova will deliver her statement uh, in Ukrainian and interpretation is available through the interpretation glow button in Zoom. Uh, I hope you can see it. Mrs. Libanova, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, do you listen me? Yes, we okay, hear Thank you. Um, Враховуючи значення рівня освіти як характеристики людського розвитку і для продовження людського розвитку, прискорення його, я хочу звернути увагу саме на цей його аспект і, зокрема, зазначити, що саме високий рівень освіти населення як жінок, так і чоловіків забезпечує Україні 74-те місце на рейтингу Human Development Index. І е, всі показники, які ми маємо, вони, власне кажучи, говорять про те, що в Україні непогана ситуація з освітою. Але нас турбує декілька речей, зокрема, як фактичних, так і методологічних. Е, якщо говорити про фактаж, то нас турбує те, що Україна поки що відверто відстає, по-перше, щодо... Е, доступу е, шкіл, е, початкових шкіл, сільських початкових шкіл до е, інтернету. Лише половина шкіл має такий доступ, причому ми е, розуміємо, що йдеться не так про е, взагалі доступ, як про доступ до якісного інтернету, швидкісного інтернету. І, власне кажучи, дистанційне навчання, спровоковане пандемією COVID-19 і неможливість навчання упродовж, скоріше за все упродовж 2021 року, офлайн-навчання, турбує нас більше за все, тому що ми розуміємо, що надалужити втрачене учням буде вкрай важко. З другого боку, 
Ми е, хоч, звертаємо увагу на результати е, ПІСА, PICA, е, згідно з якими Україна має відставання, ну, відставання умовне, воно не катастрофічне, за е, е, компетентністю учнів з математики. Нас це безумовно турбує. І ми думаємо, що з цим, з цим робити, зокрема, в програмах цілі розвитку тисячоліття, Sustainable Development. Крім того, ми продовжуємо працювати над методиками вимірювання регіонального людського розвитку. І тут ми якраз переносимо акцент з тих традиційно економічних показників, які в нас завжди домінували, на оцінку е, освіченості населення. Причому ми акцентуємо увагу на тому, що мова має йти не так про оволодіння компетентностями задля того, щоб людина була в подальшому е, конкурентна на ринку праці. Це дуже важливо, ми це розуміємо. Але не менше значення ми приділяємо тому, що освіта – це є самоцінність людського розвитку. І ми прекрасно розуміємо, що без рівня освіти, особливо, можливо, без, гуманіта... без рівня належного рівня гуманітарної освіти, ми не можемо забезпечити ані зелену економіку, ані переходу до нормального для 21-го сторіччя споживання, економного споживання і досягнення всіх цих цілей, які ми ставимо. Тому ми дуже наполегливо працюємо саме над зміною методології регіонального, вимірювання регіонального людського розвитку. Дякую за увагу. Дякую, місіс Лібанова. And thank you for flagging the importance of innovation, uh, of education. Um, it brings me back to the question of, uh, that has been posed. I mean, how can we, can we, how can we influence and change uh, fastest the attitude of society as, as the Anthropocene will require a paradigm shift in how we work with nature in, in order to promote human development. Now, with this, I would like to invite Mrs. Omid Boyner uh, from the Boyner Group and the president of the Business for Goals platform uh, in Turkey to share her views, because one dimension that we haven't brought to the table yet uh, in, in so much detail is the role that the business sector now plays in all of this. The Business for Goals platform is a joint action platform established by the private sector to promote sustainable development goals and forge new partnerships. And with this, Mrs. Boyner, I would like to give you the floor. Uh, thank you, um, all participants. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, and have uh, had to be given this opportunity uh, to share uh, in a very short speech, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, what we're doing. I would be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate and express my sincere thanks to everyone who organized this event, contribute and produced the report. In these turbulent times, the destructive developments and leaps in technology, as well as how the pandemic has evolved, radically changed all the aspects of our lives on the one hand, while issues such as hunger, poverty uh, and climate crisis push themselves into our agenda on the other. I think the main question is, will we, as one of the species called humans, have a future on Earth? Dignity, freedom, health, wealth, and peace for every single one of us have never been so hard, but still possible to achieve. The present conditions of our world show that a development which is not inclusive, which is not respectful of nature and ecosystem friendly, and is not supported with inclusive institutions cannot actually be called development at all. I hope the current pandemic has proven to everyone where we went wrong. And I hope that humankind will turn this period to an age of new enlightenment. 10 years ago, our agenda was focused on fighting climate change. 
uh, which was a responsibility towards future generations. Today, what we're facing is an ultimate climate crisis and the extinction threat uh, to our, our species. Climate change undoubtedly has consequences for the business world in Turkey, in the region and globally. The decisions which will allow humanity and thousands of other species to survive in the future are not topics only at international conferences anymore, but also issues for boards of companies, business decisions, and finally, finally daily life practices of each of us. In this period, corporate sustainability projects essentially started by companies are, as PR initiatives are now included in annual strategies, are given priority as corporate values and followed by the boards of directors. This in fact is a good development, albeit a delayed one. As Business for Goals platform in Turkey, of which I am one of the founders and which I currently chair, we seek to create a cooperative working environment for the private sector, public sector, academia, and non-governmental organizations. Cooperation between all sectors is key right now. We focus on sustainability and aim to increase the responsible and effective engagement of the private sector to integrate the sustainable development goals into their corporate policies and strategies. In essence, we are working with our uh, founders, co-founders, TÜSİAD, uh, Turkish Business and Industry Association, TÜRKONFED, Turkish Confederate of Independent Business Organizations. Uh, these two uh, institutions have over 40,000 large and small businesses as their members and 200, represent 250 different business federations. Uh, we cooperate with uh, UNDP, uh, making use of its uh, large network. Uh, I think we are in essence, one of the original or, or unique uh, formations uh, as a platform. And uh, having uh, actually lived through two major earthquakes and the pandemic, um, since our inception has proven to us how important and uh, instrumental this decision, decision was. We basically focus on three main targets. We prepare the business sector for natural disasters and climate change. We work with, uh, this, obviously with companies, but also with local governments. And uh, since the um, pandemic started, we have uh, co conducted many surveys that basically measure the preparedness of the private sector, uh, which obviously uh, impacts employment and inclus inclusion. Our second aim is to prepare the business sector for new business models, for digitalization. As uh, we all are aware, uh, especially with the pandemic, digitalization has actually gained a, a huge momentum and the business models are not going to be uh, the same. The new normal will be very, very different. And our third aim is to prepare the business sector, uh, making sure that they ensure uh, inclusivity for all disadvantaged groups. Of sustainable development goals and human development, I believe gender equality needs to be given a special focus. Gender equality in particular cuts through almost all goals and unfortunately remains one of the toughest issues to solve the world over. We observe, observe a dramatic decrease in women's participation in the economical and social life, both in Turkey and globally, in a pre period when we needed it to increase for the welfare of societies and future generations. I believe that diversity and gender equality in corporate governance is not a choice, but a must for comprehensive eco economic development and sustainable growth. I would like to ask everyone, is it possible to speak of the development and progress of a society that recognizes different rights and practices for half of its population in education, employment, entrepreneurship, politics, and economic decision-making? My answer is like birds with one wing, we cannot fly while ignoring over half the population. We are going through an extraordinary period in which the effects of the climate crisis lead to grave environmental damage regional conflicts increase, mass migration is on the rise, natural disasters come one after another, and above all, we are still 
gravely challenged by the pandemic. For this reason, as the business world, we must find ways to ensure inclusive development, progress and prosperity without leaving anyone behind. In this quest, we bear the responsibility of finding and implementing new solutions and methods that will break the mold and that were once unfamiliar and hard to imagine. The statesmen, stateswomen, business people, academicians, professionals, artists, international NGO managers, and every other person who comparatively live in, lives in better conditions have the responsibility to find new and creative paths, policies and strategies for creating sustainable habitats for all the species, including humans. We are in a critical period in terms of revealing our talent and capacity. And I believe the time for words alone is over. Now is the time to cooperate, to act, and to realize our goals for human development. Thank you again for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. And, and thank you also for emphasizing um, you know, the need to include women and to focus on, on equality, also in the sense of including 50% of the population into economic growth strategies. And as I travel through the, uh, through the region, when I still could travel um, before the pandemic, this was a constant issue on the table. Not only uh, bringing people into the labor market, but enticing women to actually study and then go into the sectors in which they have graduated. And I would uh, especially like to hand back to Mrs. Uh, Ella Libanova once more, just asking you again, uh, since you've also uh, emphasized the, the relevance of education. I mean, what advice do you give us as UNDP? I mean, where are the game changes? Where are the triggers of, of really getting the governments to adapt their policies in terms of really focusing in a strategic way on economic empowerment of women? Okay. Uh, in більш або менш тісне спілкування щодо е, порахування якості освіти і е, кількісних параметрів рівня освіти у е, стратегії сталого людського розвитку, в цілях сталого людського розвитку. Україна готувала звіт, вона продовжує цю роботу. І я сподіваюся, що кожного року моніторинг буде впливати на політику. Принаймні, бодай тому, що ми спробували окреслити завдання на 2020, 2025 і 2030 рік. Я прекрасно розумію і віддаю собі звіт в тому, що Криза 19-го, точніше, 20-го року, вона вплине на всі показники, зокрема, і освіти, як вона вже вплинула, ми це бачимо, на показники бідності і рівня життя населення. Ну, це, на жаль, та ціна, яку світова спільнота змушена заплатити. Але все ж, тобто, я веду до того, що є ризик, того, що ми не зможемо досягти тих параметрів, які ми собі запланували. Але все ж таки ми будемо намагатися. На жаль, зараз нема серед учасників прем'єр-міністра України, але я знаю його позицію з цього приводу. І я думаю, що ми будемо намагатися робити все необхідне для цього. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Libanova. And I know we are uh, approaching uh, the end of the session in a minute, but I would still like to hand the floor back to uh, Senator Savoyev once more. There's a growing awareness in the Uzbek Parliament um, for, um, for the importance of bringing nature into sustainable development measures and policies. M more generally speaking, uh, Senator, can you, and, and since we are talking also about the policies um, and, and the Prime Minister was held back by Parliament <laughs> as well, uh, you know, and, and as we as UNDP in the region increasingly look to working with the parliaments, can you again 
advise us uh, on, on, on, on the importance of that work and, and how we can be more strategic in, in this cooperation. Over to you, Mr. Sanity. Thank you very much for this very important question. First of all, I think that today we all realize that uh, parliaments on all dimensions of governance should play a more active role everywhere. It's about democracy. It's about representing the will and hopes and the anticipations of uh, people. And uh, it's about bringing some meaning to the uh, development of uh, governance. You know, uh, we, uh, our experience demonstrates that the governments being preoccupied by day-by-day -day issues sometimes uh, lose the strategic view, uh, vision. And I think that parliamentary oversight also means to, to raise these strategic issues and human development in, inevitably um, requires the apply of such a strategic vision. This is first, maybe some general part. Second, we all recognize uh, and we admit that parliamentary oversight monitoring the activity of uh, the government, bringing some criti critical assessment, putting some new goals is very important. And that's why we created here in Uzbekistan special commission, parliamentary commission, by the way, including uh, representative of both chamber, Senate and uh, legislative chamber of our parliament to uh, exercise systematic control over the activity of not only government as a whole, but specific uh, specific um, ministries and agencies. And more importantly, uh, we tried to bring this, uh, uh, this method to the regions. Frankly, I perhaps had to mention during my first uh, uh, presentation or commentary that's not only science is important by which should enhance and strengthen our, our activity on education public awareness when many years ago i was uh, involved with a special project on human development in uzbekistan i uh, noticed that all our seminars which we organized on the province of uzbekistan in the remote regions and cities and districts and towns, the villages were very important for creating new understanding among the people, both electorate and the executive branch of power. And that's why I think that more projects on public awareness and education of people organized by parliament is very important, specifically by parliament, because uh, I think that for government, it might be a little bit cumbersome, but we are parliamentarians are closer to people and we can be more perhaps effective in organizing such a public awareness. So just to summing up, parliament should bring vision, exercise effective uh, parliamentary oversight of the, every branch of, uh, of uh, the uh, executive branch of power on human development, and uh, sustainable, sustainable development goals. And third, uh, parliaments might and should take care about the public awareness and education of the people about the new paradigm of progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And, and this brings me back to, to the key question again. Uh, you know, where, where can we, you know, do more to produce that paradigm shift in people's minds that we have to work with and not against nature and that nature is part of our, should be part of our normative framework and fundamental rights. Um, the role of the private sector, um, Mrs. Boyner, just one minute before we close. This, this uh, Business Goals for, uh, for Goals platform was launched last year together with uh, UNDP uh, and, and a number of businesses, but also our institutional development partners in Turkey. Now, these platforms, what roles do they play? 
and where is their value? Thank you. Uh, well, the, uh, it has been a, a very uh, exemplary uh, uh, platform in the sense that uh, where we can see through a lot of different uh, problems, issues uh, that the business uh, world going forward faces. And uh, obviously uh, all the three aims that I have summarized in my speech, uh, preparedness for uh, climate crisis, uh, preparedness for uh, new business models and inclusion uh, are all issues uh, for the business world uh, that it cannot solve by itself. Governments cannot solve uh, these uh, by themselves either. So we definitely need a whole spectrum cooperation. Um, so in that sense, we actually provide uh, key solutions uh, or at least um, project proposals that can uh, uh, redeem some of these problems uh, in the whole sphere. Um, and the participation of different agencies, um, uh, whether it be from the uh, business sector, whether from local governments, uh, or the uh, development office of the uh, president, um, we work on actually getting at solutions, uh, not just uh, making uh, making uh, remarks uh, on what the problems uh, there are. Um, since everyone plays a key role uh, in pro providing some, some solution, I think that cooperation is very valuable. And the platform provides uh, a, a opportunity for all these sectors to put forward their uh, priorities working towards a solution. Thank you, Mrs. Boyner. Unfortunately, we cannot continue the conversation here, but I hope we will do so at another occasion. I look forward to meeting you all in person as soon as uh, it will be allowed. Again, it, um, again, ministers, uh, president, uh, unfortunately, the prime minister couldn't join us, but we, we recognize his willingness to do so and are grateful for it. It's been a great discussion, a great regional launch, and deeply grateful for your time and strategic contributions to this conversation, but also for the cooperation with you, with your teams in moving forward, bringing nature and human development closer together and recognizing that the two are intertwined is the new frontier at which you will see UNDP working with you in the future. I am looking forward forward to our continued uh, cooperation and again many thanks for having been with us today have a great rest of the year happy holidays and a great transition into a new year 2021 which will hopefully bring light at the end of the tunnel of 2020 